title, the, a, a touch misleading, just a tiny, tiny bit. Um, what I'm really going to do today is um, I thought I would kind of have fun telling you guys about what I view as some, some common misconceptions about food, the food supply chain, food prices, supermarkets, that sort of thing. I hope you find it interesting. Uh, in my, you know, like everybody, I have my own preferences about where I shop and what I eat and, and all that sort of stuff and my favorite brands and, and all that. But in my, in my professional life, which I'm going to show you guys a glimpse of today, uh, you know, I don't, I don't pick sides. Uh, you know, I, and, and, and um, in my research, in my career, I, I really strive to only kind of uh, pursue the data, pursue the facts, and then talk about what the data say. So uh, unless I really go off the cuff today, uh, pretty much everything I'm going to say is something that I, you know, I could back up, you know, with, with a study or a data set or whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do my best not to espouse my opinions today, although they do tend to leak out. Um, and so uh, I'll just kind of go through them, uh, I'll bounce around a little bit. Uh, if, if anything, if, if you have a question or whatever, just, uh, you know, I guess keep it, keep it in your pocket. And uh, I guess we have till noon, so I don't know. I'll try to talk for about a half an hour or so and then, and, and then turn it over to questions if there are any, and we'll see how far we get. I apologize that I'll keep checking my phone because I put, the, put them on my phone is where they are. Uh, I don't even know how to use a printer anymore. So um, I'll just launch right in, and I, ho I hope you enjoy it. And if you, I'll just make sure that Ann and, and Nate uh, are able to, uh, if anyone wants to get in touch with me, I, I love it. I love hearing from people. I love talking about this stuff. So if, if anything I say strikes you as interesting or, you know, you don't agree with it or you have more questions about it, just, just hit me up. I, I absolutely love it. I spent four years working for the government. I still work closely with the government. Now I'm at Cal Poly out in, out in San Luis Obispo, California. But um, I absolutely love talking about this, talking with people, educating people on it. So all right, all right here we go. Uh, so we'll get started. Uh, number one. I think particularly relevant given what's going on right now, what's going on with the news about inflation in the US is this idea that food prices are always at or near record highs. It drives me crazy. Uh, the one thing where I get, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, it's not like I'm always talking to the media. I talk to the media a lot more when I was with USDA, but I still get calls from folks in the media and the press and trade publications who wanna know why are food prices so high? Why is inflation up so much? And I almost always start by saying, well, your question is a, it's a false premise because the idea that food price inflation is way up or grocery prices are reaching record highs is almost always a fallacy, almost always. So food prices are nominally always going up, but that's driven by inflation, literally the changing value of the US dollar. And if we were to control for the value of the US dollar and go back to the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, you can pick your starting point, you'll see that food prices in the US, and it's important, I'm stressing the US, this is not true in a lot of developing nations, but food prices in the US are down, and in many cases down significantly. And that's for a lot of reasons. Our supply chain's gotten a lot more efficient, manufacturing costs have gone down due to technology. Perhaps more importantly than anything else, we're just importing a lot more food. The, you know, um, starting in the 70s and continuing to this day, the, the global sort of interconnected food supply chain has gotten a lot more robust. Uh, you know, we're, uh, like, you know, my dad's here. Shout out to my dad, and thanks for making the trip. And like, I remember growing up, I always give this anecdote in class, you love Vidalia onions, right? And Vidalia onions, they're sweet, they're delicious, but growing up here in Massachusetts, when I was a kid, we only had access to them, you know, what, a couple months out of the year. Now you can go into Stop and Shop and probably find Vidalia onions whenever you want. And it's because we're importing them from places like South America and, and stuff like that where it's warm and humid and we're able to grow them. And I mean, it's all around a good thing. So it's important to keep in mind that food prices, for the most part, are down. Do we see momentarily spikes? Yes. Are food prices up in a big way right now, like for meat, for example? Yes, absolutely. But even with meat, even with beef and pork, with everything that's going on in terms of Low, low animal inventories and COVID restricting plant operations and all that, in real terms, in terms of how food prices affect our wallets relative to our incomes and our disposable spending power and all that, we're nowhere near where we were in the 70s for all these foods. So I always encourage you to just keep the big picture in mind and understand that it's been a long time since we've had what I think could reasonably call, be called a food price crisis or a real increase in the price of food. Food in the US is cheap. It doesn't mean we don't have problems with food, with hunger and food insecurity, but food remains cheap here in the, in the richest, most developed nation in the, in the world. 
Uh, let's talk about, I'm sorry that I keep doing this. Uh, let's talk about, speaking of food prices, um, there's also a very common, in my view, misconception, the idea that eating healthy is more expensive. So I hear that, I hear that all the time, not just in my professional life, but in my private life, and I find that most people have this idea that it costs more to eat healthy. And that is true if you measure food prices certain ways, okay? So, but just a couple of things, and I know a lot of people probably realize this, but eating healthy doesn't mean eating organic kale, right? Organic kale is good for you, and it's, you know, some people think it tastes good, um, but, it, <laughs> but, but eating healthy, let's just for the sake of argument, and if, if anyone, when we do the Q&A, if anyone wants to talk about the dietary guidelines or just federal recommendations in general, we can dig into that. But I'm defining eating healthy as abiding by federal recommendations, so basically abiding by the dietary guidelines. Eating more of what the government says is recommended for increased consumption and less of what's recommended for limited consumption. And if that's the case, if you measure food per calorie, so the energy, the, the energy density of food, yes, it is true that healthy foods are more expensive, but that's because cheap, ultra-processed, shelf-stable food is very cheap per calorie, right? Per unit of energy that we eat. But in terms of actually eating a balanced diet that checks off the dietary guidelines, in terms of serving size, in terms of uh, portion size, in terms of food weight, in terms of mass, the difference between eating healthy and unhealthy is generally negligible if, you're, if you are making choices that are budget conscious and intelligence and all that sort of thing. And if you know how to prepare food and you're not wasting food and you're buying the things that are in season and you're buying things that are on promotion, uh, and I'll get into that in a second, but it is, and I, this has been shown time and time again in places like the Economic Research Service where I used to work, it is broadly a misconception that healthy food is more expensive, and many of us, I mean, I'm not gonna point any fingers in the room, but like most of us eat a diet that is pretty far out of sync with federal, with federal guidelines, myself included, across the US, the you know, average shopping basket looks nothing like what we're supposed to eat, and that's a big reason why things like obesity and type two diabetes are such big problems in the United States and associated healthcare costs and all that. But for many of us, making a transition to a healthier diet wouldn't cost much more, and in some cases would cost less. I mean, there are some, there are some great examples, right? So like, as much as I love beer, and I'm not, I'm not really gonna talk about beer today, but you know, beer uh, is expensive, right? Soda costs money, right? And these are, these are sources of calories, dense calories, that can be cut out and replaced with water, which is free or cheap, right? So that's just one example of how we can make substitutions towards a healthier diet that actually save money. So I like to point that out and talk about that a lot whenever I have the chance. Um, all right, next, moving on. Um, okay, this is another big one. Anyone here can go on your phone or go on your computer and can, and can Google sort of like, um, common grocery shopping mistakes, right? Or my favorite are these, these lists of like the, the top six ways or the top 10 ways that supermarkets are, are tricking you into spending more money, right? Or nudging you to do this. And I'm not here to say that that sort of idea is a complete fallacy, but the idea that supermarkets are sort of like, that they have this, you know, team of crack shots that are like behind the curtains and they're pulling the strings and they're sort of like making all these alterations and adjustments to the supermarket to sort of like siphon money out of our wallet and get us to spend money that we don't need to is broadly untrue. Because what's true about the grocery industry in the United States is that for the most part, it is very competitive with very, very thin profit margins. So that's why independent supermarkets, and I always struggle, I keep on meaning to do my homework and figure out like who's popular in New England for independent supermarkets, because I've completely, well, Market Basket's a good example. Market Basket remains independent. You guys all know Market Basket, right? Yeah, and yeah, Market Basket's great. I mean, they're a little bigger than the, than the breed of independent supermarkets I'm talking about, but they're really struggling. They're especially struggling during COVID when the supply chain has become more unwieldy and more expensive and all that sort of thing, but it's because they are as far downstream in the food supply chain as you can get. So in the food supply chain, it starts with farms, ranches, and vineyards, starting with raw commodities, even starting with seeds. At every step of the food supply chain, food value is added to food in the form of these transactions, okay? So everything from 
adding flavor, adding additives, adding additional ingredients, packaging it, processing it, labeling it, storing it, uh, transporting it. All of this adds value and adds cost, and ultimately that bill comes due. And it comes due in a price that is significantly higher than it was when it started at the start of the, food, at the, at the, start of the food supply chain. But retailers are consumer facing, right? And retailers, because the industry is so competitive, they're competing not just with each other, but with food away from home and direct to consumer and all of that, they're very limited in their ability to pass these costs on to consumers. So my impression of retailers, even most large retailers, is they're kind of almost always just treading water, just trying to keep costs as low as possible to keep prices as low as possible in order to maintain or expand market share. And I view this as being particularly true for our traditional kind of conventional grocery stores. And I would lump Market Basket in there. So when you think about Stop and Shop, Shaw's, Star Market, Market Basket, uh, Hannaford, right? These are, all, these are all grocery stores that we all know, many of us grew up with, right? I think it's a bit of an exaggeration to say that they're a dying breed, but they are losing market share every single year. I, I think of them as a, as a shrinking iceberg. They, they're losing market share every year within grocery to the two endpoints of price, you know, the, the, the low cost, extreme value, Walmart, grocery outlet, all these on one end, and then the sort of experiential, natural gourmet, Whole Foods, Wegmans on the other end. Because I always say, I always say, I say this to my students, I say it in, in seminars, I say it to whoever will listen, Every single one of us, when we go shopping for groceries, every single one of us can be described or defined as being either price sensitive, meaning you're trying to save money. You want to feed yourself and your family on a budget for whatever reason. It's just because you're saving or because you literally are struggling with money, so price sensitive versus quality conscious. And quality conscious means you're looking for a shopping experience that you'll enjoy. You want to get the highest quality foods and ingredients you can. You want to know where your food came from. You value traceability. You value sustainability, right? You value understanding sourcing, all that kind of stuff. You, you value the institutional knowledge of the folks who work in the grocery store, and you're willing to pay for it. And what I always contend, what I always kind of posit is if everybody's either here or here, who's kind of left in the middle? Who's, who's left for the stop and shops of the world and the Albertsons of the world? And because of that, it's a struggle. It's a struggle every day for these supermarkets to maintain market share and to keep people coming in the store. Uh, and so it's this constant push for innovation, all that sort of stuff, just to sort of keep us buying those groceries. There's not a lot going, to my understanding, there's not a lot going behind the scenes that in any way is sort of like uh, nudging us or influencing us in ways we don't understand. I, in my view, grocery stores are very, very much open books and open books about trying to keep costs low and keep, and keep food prices low. Uh, on that, let's talk about where to shop for, where to get grocery prices as inexpensively as possible. So when a lot of people think of cheap food, inexpensive groceries, a lot of people think of Walmart. Walmart is far and away the largest food retailer in the United States, far and away. It's not even close. If you don't count Sam's Clubs, do we have Sam's Clubs around here? So. Yeah, so if you don't count the membership Sam's Clubs, you know, the, they, they look like Costco's, right? So take them out of the equation and only count Walmart Supercenters and Walmart Neighborhood Markets. They're still number one to the tune of annual sales of something like $265 billion compared to second place Kroger, which is something like $100 billion, something like that. So e not even counting Sam's Club, they're more than double the second largest retailer in the US, the second, and they're bigger than any wholesaler. I was just on the phone, just a couple weeks ago, I was on the phone with um, a fellow from CNS Wholesalers. CNS Wholesalers is the largest food, sale, food wholesaler in the US. They have these gargantuan distribution centers all over the US where they carry anywhere between 200,000 and 300,000 unique you know, UPCs or SKUs. And he was saying, he said, a direct quote from him is he goes, what I wouldn't do to get Walmart's buying power, to get the sort of wholesale prices that Walmart gets. So the largest food, re the largest food wholesaler in the US is dwarfed by Walmart in terms of their buying power. So how did Walmart get to where they are? Well, they got there largely through understanding 
that the price-sensitive consumers vastly outnumber the quality-conscious experiential supermarkets, uh, shoppers and catered to them and kept costs and prices as low as possible. But, 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 I'm here to say that the, the, the numbers are in, they've been in for about five years, and Walmart's sort of uh, hegemony as the lowest priced grocery chain in the U.S. has ended. There's one chain out there that reliably, week over week, quarter over quarter, undercuts Walmart by about 15 to 17%. Anyone know who it is? Yes, who said that? Yes, yes, Aldi. And for the record, I've been to an Aldi like once in my life because everywhere I live, everywhere I go, I know that there's a lot of them. There's something like 2,000 of them now, but um, I don't see them. I don't know if I've ever, other than going in just to buy like a packet of gravy because I collect private labels is another story. But um, I've never really gone shopping at Aldi. But yes, Aldi has kind of like figured out the game, figured out the supply chain, figured out the, uh, the private label game to the point where they reliably undercut Walmart. So there's a, there's a model out there for even lower prices than Walmart. And, and I mean, I think those of you who have shopped at Walmart, I mean, shopped at Aldi understand, um, it's not exactly a direct comparison because Aldi is what's called a limited assortment supermarket. They only sell their own brands. Um, so if you want that experience where you can go shopping and pick amongst Heinz or Hunts or the own brand or the, or the organic or whatever, you're not gonna get that at Aldi. But if you're comfortable shopping at Aldi and buying the own brands, that is the statistically the lowest priced food retailer in the United States. There. German, and uh, speaking of common misconceptions, Aldi does not own Trader Joe's, and Trader Joe's does not own Aldi. They are distinct companies that did come from the Albrecht family in Germany in the 50s or whatever, but they are now two completely distinct entities. Uh, okay, how about this? Uh, local foods. The local food movement comes up a lot. The local food movement, in terms of annual percentage changes, is exploding. So local foods. Now, local food has become, I don't want to say a four-letter word, but it's become something challenging for people like me and for, and for the people who are doing research to inform policy at USDA. And the reason why is because uh, there is no sort of like universally agreed upon convention for how to define local foods. In fact, in many cases, if you go into a supermarket and says, hey, check out our local produce or check out our, 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 our local pasta sauce or whatever, that's the retailer's definition of local. And I'm not, in some cases, it's a definition that I think is totally fine. In some cases, it's kind of nuts. Uh, the most common definition of local of which I'm aware is within the same state uh, in which the store you're shopping at is at. And I mean, it's, everyone here can probably think of in some places in the US, that's just nuts. It's nuts, because you can, you can be in Lubbock, Texas, and you can have, you know, whatever, local grapefruit that was grown 500 miles away. Alternatively, the opposite happens all the time. You can be, op this came up in a, it doesn't matter where it came up. You can be operating uh, an independent supermarket in southern Pennsylvania, and you can't call blueberries from Maryland local, even though they're from 15 miles away, right? So I think there's work to be done, first of all, in terms of like, so I think that there's big work to be done to sort of integrating and synthesizing what do we, the consumers, think about local. What are we willing to, what do we value as local? What do we consider local, right? Why do we care about local? And then sort of working that into a sort of like, uni like I envision a future, and I don't think we're far off from that, where local is sort of defined, curated, labeled, and managed by a third party entity, much in the way that organic certification is, much in the way that now, if you call yourself organic, well, you're either USDA certified organic or you're not, right? And if you want the organic premiums, you have to have the USDA certification. Well, I'm not necessarily saying there will be a USDA definition of local. I don't know if it'll be USDA. Uh, I don't know if it'll be FDA. I don't know if it'll be some private third party cert certification, but I believe that day is coming. All right, so all of that said, if we sort of ignore the um, confusion about what local actually means, the number one misconception that I know about lo that, that, that I know of for local foods, and I apologize if this strikes any of you as um, disconcerting, <sighs> local foods. They are touted as having a number of benefits, okay? And a couple of the benefits that I think are probably true, local foods are good for the local economy. So local foods have, have made great strides in parts of the country in revitalizing rural economies, um, supporting family farms, that sort of thing. That's great. In many cases, local foods are better for us. 
uh, local, you know, uh, locally grown produce, nuts, that sort of thing, fruits and vegetables, things that didn't have to travel very far, things that never had to be frozen, things that never had to be um, irradiated, right? Um, you know, sure, there's, there's probably a stronger preservation of vitamins and minerals and all that. But you often hear, oh, buy local because it's better for the environment, right? Buy local because it's more sustainable. I'm here to tell you, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's malarkey, that, that, that's nonsense. And, and here's why, I'm not saying that local foods are bad for the environment. I'm saying the argument that local foods are better for the environment is just systematically, statistically untrue. Local foods, uh, however you define them, are nearly always transported by truck or even by van. And trucks and vans are the most energy intensive way that we have of moving foods around, right? So people have this idea, and it's a misgu misguided idea, that the food that we're eating that came from, you know, the, the, the citrus that we're eating or the, or the um, avocados that came from Peru have a much larger carbon footprint because they came from 4,000 miles away in Peru relative to the ones that we can get from 100 miles down the road. But the avocados that moved overseas on a carrier from Peru were moved on one of the absolute most, um, the least energy intensive ways you can move it. Yes, a carrier ship uses a lot more energy than a truck, but it carries tons and tons and tons and tons of food and other goods, right? So the, the actual economic impact per pound of that produce is spread out really, really dramatically, right? So that's point number one. But point number two, those avocados were grown in Peru for a reason, right? They were grown there because the climatic conditions there and the soil conditions and all that sort of thing are conducive to growing avocados efficiently, using a minimal amount of soil, water, that sort of thing, right? And so you have to ask yourself, and you should always be asking yourself, is it a better choice for the earth or even myself to be pursuing locally grown foods in places where they are not grown efficiently and sustainably or without an input of a significant amount of, of resources, okay? Because we're seeing local farms popping up everywhere. And you start hearing crazy stuff like, oh, hey, check out these berries that were grown in North Dakota, right? And I'm not anti, people are always like, oh, so that Volpe guy is anti-local foods. That's not the case, it's not the case, right? But, but the local food movement is increasingly done intelligently and sustainably and all that, but mistakes have been made along the way. There have been major bumps along the road. And probably the two most significant bumps in my, in my opinion are, adding to the significant stress we already have on the truck transportation industry, which is, that's the, in my view, that is the COVID aside, right? All, all COVID did was accentuate this trend that truck transportation is probably the single biggest constraint in the food supply chain today. It's not going anywhere. Everybody in the industry would like to just do this and say, okay, next quarter, next month, there'll be more trucks, there'll be more drivers, trucks will be more affordable. That ain't happening, it's getting worse. Um, and if I had a slide deck, I would show you data from AMS showing that. So local foods is highly dependent on trucks and vans and all that, so it's added additional stress onto that. And also in many cases, local foods are being grown in places where they require significantly more inputs to grow. So more water, more soil, more land, more nutrients, more fertilizer, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, what do you call that thing that kills bugs? More pesticides, right? And so, the, sorry. I, blank for a second. So that's not really great for the environment, right? And it's not really great for us. So I just encourage you to think critically about what local foods mean to you and what you're looking for for local foods. By all means, support your local farms, by all means. But when they're growing things that are conducive to the local area and are in season and, and all that sort of stuff. I mean, we're members of a CSA. We love it, right? But we're in California where pretty much everything grows all the time. All right, how am I doing? I'm gonna do a couple more, a couple more, a couple more. Hope you guys are having fun. Uh, okay, here's a fun one, super relevant. Super relevant for where we are right now. I'm an economist and the law of demand, which is like no law at all, states that the price of any good is going to peak at the same time as demand. So when something is in, mo when the demand curve shifts to the right and demand spikes up, so goes the price. That's, that's the law of demand. But the law of demand when it comes to food and a lot of things, but food doesn't hold because many foods are actually priced the lowest when their demand is the highest. And that's most, the number one example I have for this, the 101, Econ 101 in cases, Thanksgiving turkeys. So Thanksgiving turkeys are cheapest right now. 
And if you were to look, if I were to plot average per pound turkey prices in the US over time, it would look something like this, where just like everything else, nominally it's going up, but every year within the year, it dips significantly right around now and stays low until like late December, even early January, because a lot of people, not us, but a lot of people do the double turkey thing, right? Turkey for Thanksgiving and then turkey for Christmas. We've never done that, have we? Yeah, but, but it's a thing, people do it. And so, and, so, and so turkey demand stays strong throughout the holidays. Now why? It's interesting to think about why, okay? It's not because turkey production is up. In fact, what we see is every year at this time of year, a divergence, a split between retail turkey prices and wholesale turkey prices, okay? Because wholesale turkey prices just kind of keep doing their thing and retail prices are dipping. So why? This comes back to what I was saying earlier about retailers scratching and clawing every day for that food dollar getting you in the door. Retailers of all stripes, of all stripes, and I'm even including the whole foods of the world, they want you to know that they're offering you food as inexpensively as possible. They all want you to know that, whether they're doing it effectively or not. This time of year is a gift to retailers because there's no more effective way to signal prices by slashing the price of turkeys. We're all looking at the price of turkey, every single one of us, every, almost every single one of us, vegetarians excluded, are looking to buy that turkey. So we're searching turkey prices. Where can I get that 25 pound turkey at a decent price? And so retailers understand it's incredibly effective advertising to promote this very low price for turkeys, get you in the door, you buy the turkey and then you buy everything else you need, right? The stuff in the mashed potatoes, the Martinelli's, all that kind of stuff, right? So an example, this is, um, this is gonna feel a little bit like a tangent, but like milk. So, so milk doesn't necessarily really have seasonal demand. Like everything it does, it has ebbs and flows during the year. But milk, milk is the most common loss leader in the supermarket throughout the years, right? Milk prices are nearly always at or below cost. Retailers usually lose money on the sale of milk, right? And the story there is similar. Almost all of us buy milk, okay? We buy milk all the time. Those of us who buy milk buy it regularly because milk is very bulky and it's almost impossible to store, right? It takes up a lot of space in your fridge. It has to be uh, refrigerated. It has to be kept at that temperature. I don't know if any of us have ever been like, oh, sweet, look at that price of milk. I'm going to buy four, right? Like, it, that, that doesn't happen, right? Plus, milk has a lot, whole lot of compliments in the supermarket. Milk goes with cereal and coffee, cookies, all kinds of great stuff, right? But so this idea has kind of like popped up that, oh, that must be why milk is in the back of the supermarket because I have to, even if I say, I just need milk, I'm gonna pop into Stop and Shop and get that gallon of milk. Well, I have to walk through the entire supermarket to get to it and along the way I'll be like, yo, I need those, I need the Captain Crunch, right? I need, but that's actually, that is itself another misconception. Milk is in the back of the store because that's where every supermarket builds their reefer units. And you know, then there's the, the loading dock specifically for those dairy trucks that comes up to the back and that was just the most co cost effective way to do it. So it's, it's not to get us to walk through the store. But anyway, almost anything you can think of. Uh, ice cream, obviously turkeys, uh, you know, hot dogs and hamburgers. I'm thinking of all warm ones. What do we, oh, like, uh, like hot cocoa, right? All that kind of stuff. Prices typically fall when demand is the highest, right? And so, do with that information as you see will, but you, you'll probably note that not only are the shelf prices down, but promotional activity is way up during the periods of peak demand. You can often get these things cheaper than you could off season. So there's implications for stuff you can store as well. All right, one more. I'm gonna do one more, and then I'm gonna open it up to questions. So I hope you guys have some questions on your mind. Um, okay, let's talk about GMOs. Woof, right? GMOs. So, uh, Probably the number one conception, misconception about GMOs I know of is that you're able to avoid them. I doubt that there's anybody in this room who fails to eat GMOs every single day. Uh, and the reason why is because probably 75%, if not 80% of the products in a given supermarket feature field corn as, as either a direct or indirect ingredient. So field corn, corn. When USDA or Bloomberg or Business Insider or anybody is talking about, hey, the price of corn's going up. Hey, corn, uh, 
the, this year's stock of corn is down, or yield per acre of corn is up, or whatever. We're talking about field corn. 96% of the corn grown in the U.S. is field corn, which is not edible by humans, not, not directly, right? But that is the corn that's used to make corn syrup, corn flour, corn meal, and animal feed. And so through that, we're always eating corn, always. And something like 99% of field corn is GMO, genetically, genetically modified. So numbers are similar for soybeans, wheat, barley, all of these field crops, literally the foundation of our food supply chain. It's all GMO. So I'm not saying this fits the bill for anybody in this class, I mean, in this church, but like, but I can tell you, like, I've been teaching my AGB 404 class at Cal Poly now for seven years, and I always get kind of a chuckle, it's a little mean, but I, I'm always like, okay, so who here, like, never, ever, ever eats GMOs? Never. And there's always someone like me, you know, I, I don't trust them, you know? But like, she'll raise her hand as she's like eating fruit snacks, you know? And I'm like, you literally are holding a bag of GMOs in your hand, like that, because that's all field corn, and that was 100%. So. With that said, I'll wrap up on a positive note, which is just to say that like, everyone's welcome to their opinions on GMOs. And at the margins, at the margins, the, the production sector is not my, my, my strength. It's not where I do a lot of my thinking or reading or writing or anything. But at the margins, is there some questionable stuff going on with GMOs? Sure. I, the idea where, I mean, Neil Young just wrote an album about this. The idea that there are farmers that are, you know, because of the vertical coordination of the supply chain are basically being forced to sell seeds that they're not used to, all that sort of thing. Have there been experimentations with GMOs that haven't worked out? Absolutely. Are there some cases where food would probably taste better if it had not been genetically modified? Probably. But are GMOs dangerous, the kind of GMOs we're eating every day? No, ab absolutely not, right? I mean, it, it, our corn, wheat, soybeans, rice, they've been modified so long that if there was some fundamental issue in terms of its impact on our weight or our health or likelihood of getting cancer, that would have come out in the wash by now. So for anyone who's all concerned about them, those sorts of GMOs are absolutely not dangerous. And in fact, I would take it a step further. And I would say that GMOs, the kind I'm talking about, the, the genetic modification of field crops to make them resistant to pests, resistant to extreme temperatures, resistant to drought, resistant to floods, the things that we're dealing with more and more every season, every year, I would kind of argue that without it, our food supply chain would fall apart and we'd be unable to feed the population. Because every single year, every single year, the global food supply chain is called upon to feed more people with less land, okay? And so the only way that's going to work is if we, as a world, increasingly get better at driving efficiency and productivity in the food supply chain. And that comes back to the where I started, where food prices are down, and so much of that is because production and yields are way up and costs are down, right? The variable cost, the production cost of food and all that is way down. So I don't think GMOs are scary. I don't even think they're particularly controversial. They're here, they're here to stay, and we need them. Now that's, of course, there are some horror stories as there are with everything else, but anyway. Um, I wanted to have time for questions, so I'm gonna stop there. Awesome, let's do it. Okay, yes, what do, you, what do you want me to say? Can you repeat that so people can Oh, sorry, we got a, uh, can I make a comment about Dollar General stores? What, what, anything specific? Well, I think it's an interesting model. Yes. And I would like to talk about that model and how it's working and where they are and what the impacts. Okay, so Dollar stores are the largest growing segment of retail in the United States in terms of physical footprint. Okay, now notice I said retail, not food retail. That's all retail. Nothing is growing faster than dollar stores in the US today, right? So dollar stores had their big break during the Great Recession. That, when was that, 2007? So they had their big break during the recession because Americans were out of work, consumer confidence was down, wages were down, and people realized, whoa, a lot of this stuff, food and non-food, that I buy regularly, I can literally buy it for a dollar at the dollar store, right? So dollar stores had their big break. It drove a lot of investment. And dollar stores even realized, hey, opportunistically, we can get our hands on food and sell food cheap and get into that market. Okay, so Dollar General, can I ask why you singled out Dollar General? Uh, well, Are they big here? I've seen Dollar General stores in uh, the rural part of New York State. 
right. Oh, okay. So, so Dollar General, Dollar General is arguably at the forefront of dollar stores that are successfully selling food. So here's, here's all, we can talk about dollar stores for an hour, but here, here's all I'll say about dollar stores. In all dollar stores, including Dollar General, have a long way to go before they have developed the infrastructure to successfully manage the cold chain to sell a full line of, super, of, of groceries, okay? So there are these things called Dollar General markets that some of you may have seen, I don't know. They're better at it than most, but even they regularly are incapable of reproducing what we think of as the perimeter of the supermarket, and we're a ways off from that, right? At some point, at some point, a dollar store chain, if they want to go further down this road, has to either do what Amazon did, which is acquire a grocery chain to get the infrastructure, or physically build the infrastructure, the distribution centers, the cold storage, the reefer units, all that sort of stuff. That's hard to do. So to that point, and then I'll move on, I talk to independent grocers all the time as part of my job. Most, most recently, within the last few months, if I pick the brains of people where I live in California, they, they think of dollars, the independent grocers think of dollar stores sort of as like gnats, as pests. They're like, yeah, they show up and we kind of stop selling soap because people go to the dollar stores because they're, they're cheaper, but they still fear Walmart and Aldi but they fear Walmart more than anything else. A Walmart or even a Costco comes to town and their revenues go down 5% overnight and they never come back. So uh, if you want to talk about dollar stores after, I'm happy to. So I, I saw a question in the back. Yes, uh, the gentleman. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll start with the question about organics. So this might be a direct answer to your question, but here's what, here's what we know about organics, okay? Number one, the way organic production is regulated and defined today, we would not be able to feed the population with organic production alone, okay? So that's, that's a constraint to organic uh, expansion. It's not a direct answer to the gentleman's question, but organic production is fundamentally different from conventional production takes more land, generally requires more resources, most importantly requires more labor, you know, in the fields. So organic production is, is not the, the panacea to feeding the population and we're not gonna shift that way now. More relevant to the gentleman's question, organic certification and oversight is thin. Thin, 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 okay? The USDA does not have anywhere near the resources to actually oversee, regulate, inspect, you know, check, all the so-called organic production out there. So are there stories like the gentleman brought up about farmers who are reaping the organic premium without actually engaging in organic production? Absolutely, right? But I will say the good news on that is that increasingly the USDA is reaching out and going through third parties that are also organic certifiers. It's still a very, very porous system, but oversight is improving. And it's also worth pointing out that to my understanding, to my belief, most folks who go into organic production go into it because they believe in it. They're not trying to make more money necessarily. They're actually trying to create food that is better for people, better for the planet, that sort of thing. So I think in general, the news is good, but does, do stories like the gentleman's come through? 100%, and there's really currently no widespread spread, spread solution to it. Uh, I wanna get it to, to at least one more question, so I would just say flowers. Flowers and lobster and oysters are the three highest margin items in the supermarket. And by margin, I mean the difference between what we pay for them and what the supermarket paid for them. And that's a reason why flowers and lobsters in particular are the only supermarket products that I know of which are regularly transported by air because air is so expensive and so energy intensive, but it's crazy fast right? 
So it's kind of hard to imagine what's the disconnect. When I'm at a restaurant, I would never buy it because I just can't, but like, if I'm at a restaurant where I live in California and I see Maine lobster on the menu, I know that that was flown out and I can't even imagine what that restaurant is pulling in in terms of the margin on that lobster if it overcomes the cost of flying it across the country. Um, I know it's not a direct answer to the gentleman's question, but in many cases, especially today, because of the shortages we have in our domestic food supply chain, in many cases, it's faster and more efficient to just get inputs or foods elsewhere. Some weird things are happening because I don't know if you guys heard, like we have a chronic aluminum shortage and a chronic CO2 shortage right now in the United States, right? So that is driving some really weird transactions that I never thought I would see happening that end up being cost efficient because otherwise, if you tell any food manufacturer, hey, do what you do, but without aluminum, forget it, just not gonna happen, right? So, it, so they have to get that aluminum for whoever it may be or else they literally can't bring their product to market. All right, one more question because I know you guys gotta go. Uh, yeah, your hand was up. Oh my God. Ugh. Two of my questions are about private labels. I can't believe I skipped them. I wish I'd known. Uh, oh my God, private labels are my bread and butter. I love, I love talking about private labels, right? <laughs> the, sh the short answer is, unfortunately, retailers work very, very hard to make what you're trying to do impossible to do. Private labels or store brands, right, are sold, packaged, and marketed, and now placed in supermarkets so as to convince consumers that you're buying something that is unique at the store that you're shopping at. Not necessarily the store, but the chain, right? That's the idea. Now, I think most of you realize in probably 90% of cases, that's not the case. Now, I'm not trying to say that's anything nefarious. In fact, I'm, Amazon issues aside, I'm pro-private label because private labels, I think, are a great way to save money because it's actually true that what you're getting is something that's exactly the same as the national brand, but cheaper, right? You're just cutting out some of the marketing costs, some of the packaging costs in some cases, transportation costs. But the overwhelming majority of private labels are made by national brand manufacturers. The overwhelming majority, Kellogg's, General Mills, Heinz, Del Monte, Green Giant. These are all national brand manufacturers that, I mean, my mom was just, she told me, like my mom used to do it for a living in a sausage factory, right? It's as simple as, okay, our quota's done for the day, slide on the Albertsons label, keep going, right? Same product, same exact product, but now it says Albertsons or Safeway or, or Ahold or whatever it may be. Um, so the, the basically blunt but unsatisfying answer to the question, your only hope of getting a true private label is to shop at only a handful of retailers in the U.S., that actually manufacture and innovate their own private labels in the process that we call vertical integration. So out here in New England, Stop and Shop. Stop and Shop is owned by Ahol Delhaize, which is a Western European ancient retailer that is making big roads in the US. And Ahol Delhaize has a private label campus. I don't even know where it is. And they're pumping out their own cereals, their own ice creams, all that sort of thing. But some people say, I just want to close the loop here. There are people who claim that they can read the back of a package and they can figure out, oh, actually, you know, this was made by Hunt. Or, oh, if you can do that, I haven't figured it out. Because these labels are, the sourcing and labels and everything are carefully designed so as to not be, uh, it's not misinformation, it's not, it's not a falsehood, but it's designed so you can't readily look at it and say, oh, this is obviously the Del Monte, obviously Heinz. So out here, stop and shop, out west, Albertsons, uh, Kroger, uh, which I don't think Kroger has a presence out here. They make their own. But I mean, even look at Walmart and Costco. Walmart and Costco hang their hats on great value in Brooklyn, respectively. They don't make any of their own products. Absolutely none. It's all sourced from either national manufacturers or third-party dedicated private label manufacturers. So I guess we're at time. We have 
Thank you for having me, Ann. Yeah. So I had a blank. I love this stuff. So I just want to stress, right? If anyone wants to chat after this, I can stick around. But um, Ann and Nate know how. And by the way, Nate, great job up there today. But yep. But 